education and civil rights on the one hand, and uh, dealing with poverty. I remember my parents talking, and other people talking in the community, you know, the distrust they had of Goldwater, that he didn't like African Americans, and it was evidenced in everything he did. I also remember the basic distrust of Johnson. He was a Southerner, and as a child, I just didn't know any, any good white people that had draws and twain, so. Goldwater had to realize that he could not win at all if he didn't have the South, and then therefore that vote on civil rights was very important. He was not a racist. He never was a, a segregationist. He never uh, would have gone for the, the Jim Crow uh, type of government. That's not, that was not Goldwater. My fellow Americans, I am about to sign into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Goldwater uh, voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He had voted for both the Civil Rights Acts in the 50s. He was told at that time by people like Everett Dixon, Barry, if you vote for this bill, it will kill any presidential chance. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Goldwater really wanted to antagonize all black Americans. He had picked a good way to do it. Johnson saw it as a political opportunity, which indeed it was. Also may be scary, though, because he knew he was losing a large part of the Democratic South and that Goldwater would appeal to the very base that would have been his base. So it was both a moment of opportunity and a moment of peril. We represent the majority of the people in Alabama who hate niggerism, Catholicism, Judaism, and all the isms of the whole world. So said Robert Creel of the Alabama Ku Klux Klan. He also said, I like Barry Goldwater. He needs our help. The biggest adverse problem that Lyndon Johnson had was the racial issue. There's, there was nothing like it. Remember, he sent Lady Bird down on the Lady Bird special uh, to go through the South in the hopes of, of salvaging some of the South. There was concern about her safety. Uh, there was a lot of abuse when she'd stop and speak and people would talk, uh, you know, nigger lover and all that kind of stuff. I recall specifically her saying at one stop now, just a second, you've had your turn to make your point. Let me have mine. I'm so glad to be back here in the South that I love so dearly. So even if you don't like what I have to say, at least you understand the way I say it. And, and of course, that brought some humor and a little bit of levity, which, uh, frankly, uh, we needed in that very tense time. The overall sense in the black community, to me, and this is my opinion, is that who do we trust to um, make sure that these things don't just go away? And what happens if Johnson's not elected again? We can have it for this. Um, period of time, and then they take it away. My parents got me involved in the ads. I did Kodak film, I did SpaghettiOs, I did Cool Pops, McCall's catalog, Sears catalog, and then I auditioned for the Daisy ad.
mistakes to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. We must either love each other or we must die. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. That was a very effective ad. <laughs> I think it only ran once or a couple of times, and then they took it off the air, but they showed it again and again and again. All three television networks had run it in its entirety within their newscasts uh, by the end of the week. And so by the end of the week, probably 100 million people had seen it. You know, I know my grandmother was really concerned because there was a lot of negative publicity. A lot of people were saying bad things about how could parents let their ch child blow up in an atomic bomb, stuff like that. Goldwater's reaction was that that pretty much what they expect from that blankety blank. I know he was uh, very upset. He thought it was dirty politics and resented the implication, implying that somehow or another he was going to set off a nuclear explosion. Had Goldwater been more political, had Goldwater been shrewder, had Goldwater actually thought he could win the election, he would have offered to split the cost of the advertising, saying it expressed his sentiments exactly. The Daisy ad was great. <laughs> we thought the Daisy ad was great. And even the Daisy ad didn't even mention Goldwater. Everybody knew what it meant, which showed that Goldwater had put him in a position where people understood that this ad was about Goldwater. That was the genius of the spots in 64. Not because it changed the public's opinion, but rather because it capitalized on sentiments that were already present in the electorate, especially Johnson's series called The Bombs Away Spots. Radioactive fallout from atomic testing is a biological risk. There's one on the, on the test ban treaty. Yeah. They're suggesting we pull that one. Let's be sure that we don't get into something like we did on that spot thing, that we're overdoing it. Overdoing it. You remember the little girl pulling the pedals out on the spot and the arm going out? Yeah. I just don't want, don't want them to think that I'm overdoing it. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. Do you know what people used to do? They used to explode atomic bombs in the air. Now, children should have lots of vitamin A and calcium, but they shouldn't have any strontium-90 or cesium-137. These things come from atomic bombs, and they're radioactive. They can make you die. It's too late. A vision of him as an extremist had already percolated into the national consciousness, and he couldn't erase that. And it was based on what he said and done, because he was extremist, at least when he talked, he was. Is he for the Barry who said, I seek the support of no extremist? Or is he for the one who said, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice? And how is a Republican supposed to indicate on his ballot which Barry he's voting for? It was a brutal, brutal uh, beating that Senator Goldwater took, utterly unjustified. I think it embittered a lot of us. Uh, a lot of us woke up and said, okay, this is how the game is played. And, uh, and we would play the game too. Choice. It was a documentary film that was produced to attack Lyndon Johnson as a person who had degraded the nation's morals, who had undermined the social fabric of the United States of America by tolerating corruption and, and sexual promiscuity. It was a, a shocking film. Here was the key to Goldwater's advertising and his personal feelings. He hated Lyndon Johnson with a passion. He had long regarded Lyndon Johnson as a crook, as sleazy. He believed the American public didn't understand what kind of man they had in the Oval Office. 
And so a good deal of that advertising was very personally directed at Linda Johnson. Slowly they begin to understand that something must be wrong, badly wrong, at the top. New America. Ask not what you can give, but what you can take. When it was shown to Goldwater, he is reported to have said, that's a racist film, we can't show that. Officially, the Goldwater people said they never used it, but the truth is, is that the spot was used across the country. Republican supporters of Goldwater would host these house parties and, and show the film. It just wasn't aired on television, but it still was out there accusing Johnson of having undermined the nation's social fabric. Young citizens for Johnson have as guest of honor Lucy Baines Johnson, youngest daughter of the president, who is on a one-woman campaign tour for her father. The charming 17-year-old Lucy is the hit of the evening. Then the teenager takes over as Lucy does the Watutsi with all the verve of an expert. Lucy says she'll never tire of the campaign trail as long as the band plays on. The program originally scheduled at this time will not be broadcast. The one thing that Goldwater did to try to change the image that people had of him as a, a reckless cowboy was to rush to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania and sit down with Dwight Eisenhower. Our opponents are referring to us as warmongers and I'd like to, to know what your opinion of that would be. You've known me a long time. Well, Barry, in my mind, this is actual Tommy rot. Now, You've known about war. You've been through one. I'm older than you. I've been in more. But I'll tell you, no man that knows anything about war is going to be reckless. Unfortunately, Eisenhower looked like it was the last place on earth he wanted to be. The two men had no rapport, no chemistry. Eisenhower was trying to bail out a guy who had been attacking him less than a year ago as an appeaser. So I think Eisenhower was doing his patriotic duty as a Republican, but his heart wasn't in it, and it showed. On that note, the dialogue between General Dwight David Eisenhower and Senator Barry Goldwater came to a close. The one guy who really probably could have helped him was, was somebody that Goldwater and his people didn't really welcome into the, into the fold. Ladies and gentlemen, we take pride in presenting a thoughtful address by Ronald Reagan, Mr. Reagan. Reagan had this idea to give this nationally televised speech. The Goldwater people didn't want to pay for it. They didn't want to do it. So Reagan went out and raised the money and aired the speech himself. And this idea that government is beholden to the people, that it has no other source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and the most unique idea in all the long history of man's relation to man. This is the issue of this election. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. The speech is called A Time for Choosing, which may be Ronald Reagan's best speech ever. And, and, and that's saying a lot for Ronald Reagan because he gave a lot of great speeches. But this speech was a masterpiece. Of government. And it probably made the best case for Barry Goldwater that anybody, including Barry Goldwater, had made for himself. Our Democratic opponents seem unwilling to debate these issues. They want to make you and I believe that this is a contest between two men that were to choose just between two personalities. Well, what of this man that they would destroy? Is he the brash and shallow and trigger happy man they say he is? I knew him long before he ever dreamed of trying for high office. And I can tell you personally, I've never known a man in my life I believed so incapable of doing a dishonest or dishonorable thing. I think his speech was such a tremendous event that at the end of that speech and the end of that election, Ronald Reagan was being talked of as the successor to Barry Goldwater as Mr. Conservative. And that's what launched Reagan's political career. I think it would have been launched anyhow, but that made him to the whole conservative movement nationwide was talking about that speech. 
we will keep in mind and remember that Barry Goldwater has faith in us. He has faith that you and I have the ability and the dignity and the right to make our own decisions and determine our own destiny. Thank you very much. Reagan's speech, that was the high point of the campaign. The fruition of the Goldwater campaign was 15 years later with the Reagan revolution. You know, when you sense a landslide coming, and everybody did, there really isn't a whole lot of excitement on Election Day, except for the winners and their families and the immediate staffs who start fighting over jobs. I was in D.C. to get my driver's license renewed. There was a black lady there, and I had a Goldwater button on, <laughs> and she started laughing. <laughs> sort of good luck to you, fella. <laughs> Election night, the senator was at home. Then as the votes came in, the Goldwater wasn't shocked, obviously. The decision was made that he was not going to come out that night and make any concession. That's like asking a guy who's been knocked out on the floor, hey, did the guy beat you? Goldwater only carried his home state of Arizona and the Deep South. Those are the only states he carried. And no Republican had ever been elected dog catcher in Mississippi or Alabama or Georgia or South Carolina or Louisiana for years, for years, for decades, century. <laughs> And now the South is solid Republican. It's a divided country. And it started with that 1964 election, all because Barry Goldwater voted against the Civil Rights Act. Just that one vote carried the South. That's how important that was to those Southern states. It, it's kind of sad. Johnson achieved what he wanted, which was he got his mandate. He got the highest percentage of anybody who, who'd run for president. He did what he wanted to do by beating FDR by three-tenths of a point. He said when he looked back upon that night that he felt that he could picture all these people going into the election booth and pulling the lever for him. And then he knew finally, finally, that the American people loved him. I think he knew how important political capital was, and I think he knew how he was going to spend it. I mean, look at how he rolled out legislation. And used to say, you know, he, that wonderful line is, what the hell's the presidency for? Let's get this done. Let's pass these bills. It's 3 a.m. and your children are safe and asleep. But there's a phone in the White House and it's ringing. Something's happening in the world. Your vote will decide who answers that call. Whether it's someone who already knows the world's leaders, knows the military, someone tested and ready to lead in a dangerous world. It's 3 a.m. and your children are safe and asleep. Who do you want answering the phone? I'm Hillary Clinton and I approve this message. The 1964 campaign made it essential that you have a professional campaign with advertising that was close to the equal of Madison Avenue's ads for products. There is a bear in the woods. For some people, the bear is easy to see. Others don't see it at all. The DNA of that Daisy Girl spot is in a lot of what we see today. Isn't it smart to be as strong as the bear? The use of emotion in political advertising that's directly from that Daisy Girl spot. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of gray, for purple mountains, majesty above the fruited plain. America, America. God I do see similarities with the current political commercials. I think to myself, had the Daisy ad not happened, how would that have changed the commercials of today? So in a way, I don't want to say I'm ashamed, but I, in a way I'm thinking, you know, it's pretty dirty politics, some of these commercials. And I can't say I agree with it. 
I know John Kerry is lying about his first Purple Heart because I treated him for that injury. It's probably true from that moment on that the amount of time, resources, and money that was spent on television ads just kept escalating, so that a huge part of campaigning became, what are the ads going to be on television? This is where so much attention is going, to raising the funds, number one. That's why they go to those stupid fundraisers, and then putting these ads on television. I think it's a negative thing. Oh, clearly. Clearly it is, mainly because it's made money all important to campaign. Right. And uh, it's like the presidency is for sale, and in a way it is for sale. In 1964, you see for the first time that the South is moving Republican. You can see for the first time that the Northeast is moving toward the Democrats. And the West became divided. Poverty is not a trait of character. It is created by circumstances. Democrats became more clearly identified with two things, larger government and more services and civil rights. Today you have a Republican Party that believes that government should be small and should leave most of the work of government to the states and localities and that the individual rights should be honored above all. The party images, which had been fuzzy until 1964, became very distinct. I'm Raymond Massey, and this is what really gets me. This is a picture of a dead American soldier shot by the Viet Cong guerrilla in Vietnam. What's our government doing about it? And the 275 other dead Americans? Nothing, not a thing, because we are fighting a no-win war in Vietnam, a war we don't want to win. Well, as an American, I don't like it. I don't like our policy, and I don't like no-win wars, especially wars our men are getting butchered in. Don't you want to stop this war? Don't you care about what's happening over there? Well, I care, I care a lot. Another precedent for modern campaigns from 1964 is that the issues that really matter don't get discussed. Vietnam, which became the issue for four years. Johnson was the peace candidate, and it was one of the reasons why he won. He actually said during the campaign, we're not about to send American boys nine or 10,000 miles away from home to do what Asian boys ought to be doing for themselves. And we all know what actually happened. People should have probed Johnson more about what he might have done. It's a lesson for us in every campaign. Make the candidates discuss the issues that really matter as we see them, rather than allowing them to put certain subjects off limits because it suits their political needs. The legacy of the 64 convention and a Barry Goldwater's nomination run, that was the moment when the conservative movement to which I belong went down to an historic defeat, but out of that defeat, we captured the Republican Party, and basically conservatives have been the dominant force in the Republican Party ever since. They haven't won every battle, but everybody has to now deal with that conservative movement, and it represented, I think, the death knell of liberal republicanism. You don't hear people call themselves liberal republicans anymore. One of the driving issues of conservatism was the size and power and growth of government. And that is certainly the big issue today. Tea Party folks, they would have been with us in the Cal Palace. The business of Goldwater being the godfather of the Tea Party and the Republican Party now, I'll just say it flat out as a Goldwater Republican, they're political nihilists. Goldwater didn't say we shouldn't have any government. Goldwater didn't say every part of government should be rejected. Goldwater believed in states' rights with a little s and a little r. He wasn't talking this talk you hear now of practically John C. Calhoun uh, secessionist talk. I think the legacy on the Democratic side really started before the election with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. 
What Lyndon Johnson did was say, that's the first flag we're planting. There are a lot of more flags coming. And we are gonna be the party uh, that will end, end discrimination, whether it's in the voting booth and public accommodations in the workplace and housing. And we're gonna be the party that uses government to help the most vulnerable people in our society and tries to use it to give them a hand up, not just a hand out. Four great bills in civil rights, 60 bills in education, Medicare and Medicaid, arts and the humanities, public broadcasting, so much was done. He one time said, some people want power just to march around to hail to the chief and strut through the stage. I want to do things. And so he used the power that he gained in that mandate as fully as he could. And had it not been for the war in Vietnam, he would be still remembered as one of the most extraordinary presidents. And his due is now coming as the 50th anniversary. We now realize domestically what he did. If you look at what happened to Goldwater before he died, he was an entirely different human being. I mean, he was for gay rights, gays in the military. I think he was a very honest politician. I don't think there's anybody who can say any different. He's the one who went to the Oval Office and told Richard Nixon, it's all over, you're gonna lose in the Senate. You know, only somebody like Goldwater could march in there and look at the President of the United States and say, time to go. I think he demonstrated that you can, uh, you can argue and disagree, but don't have to be disagreeable. At the end of the day, you can put your politics down and go and have a drink and enjoy the company of the opponents.